Lecture 37 today is on Galois theory. And there was enough stuff that this morning I decided we would not have any quiz today. So it's going to be just one lecture. Um, maybe we'll try to take about a 30 second stretch break, but we probably won't stop the camera uh, in the middle sometime. Uh, it's going to be pretty tough, but I think it's I think it's going to be rewarding if you can really focus and pay attention. And uh, I'm going to try to review group theory as we go. So this is kind of a little bit of a review of group theory because Galois theory is again all about applying group theory to field theory. So it'll be partially review. Lecture 38 on Friday will be a more broad review of other things. So fundamentals, a couple detailed examples, and the insolvability of a quintic. But before we do that, I was rummaging through some old photos last night, trying to find a photo of me with like my teens when I was younger. And I did find one, so I have to show you here. And actually, I was looking through old yearbooks in high school, and the really big guy uh, was only one grade ahead of me. So I think Wikipedia must have just been wrong, which I guess isn't surprising. He was only one grade ahead of me, so um, <clears throat> I don't think he was five years older than me. Anyway, can you find me in the picture? I'm not the very smallest. It, I, my shoulder pads are kind of big. Here I am right there. Um, actually, one guy who's a bit smaller than me, it seems, was kind of the biggest bully, this guy right there. But, uh, the, the guy tallest, that was the guy who was the professional wrestler, who, again, was just one grade ahead of me, but uh, according to Wikipedia, was five years older than me. I, that's probably, that can't be right. So, anyway, uh, so there's a picture of my football team. Um, <laughs> There you go. Got the picture. I mean, just the time I was about to go away from there. And I was also rummaging through some other things, and I found my, a picture of myself in a bubble magazine. There we go. So that's just 30 years ago or so. Um, I had hair. Well, I guess you've seen my hair on my door anyway. I've got some pictures of myself too. So this was in a Bethel magazine. And actually, if you look in a 1990 catalog, I think the same picture is in a 1990 catalog in color. So. <laughs> Anyway, all right, back to math. Oh, that's <laughs> All right, so this first slide is some basic concepts, some basic definitions. Um, I think these definitions could certainly be on the final exam. Galois theory fundamentals. All right, so here's the background. Let E be a field. Actually, I'm saying something a little differently than the book does here. I'm going to remind you that you can consider the set of all automorphisms of E, although compared to what we did in chapter 6 when we were talking about group automorphisms, these are ring automorphisms. You could call them field automorphisms as well because we are talking about fields. So they're not just operation preserving, they're doubly operation preserving. Automorphisms mean going from E to itself. Auto is in self. They are isomorphisms as well. They are one-to-one -one and onto. And this is going to be a group under function composition. Okay, Not a ring. We're not doing some other operation with these automorphisms. We are just composing them. Just one binary operation. It's a group. Um, and if we wanted to, the book doesn't do this. We could call it auto e if we wanted to. There are textbooks out there that do do that. I don't know why the author didn't bother writing. I guess the other one to stay consistent with, more consistent with the Galois notation that we briefly introduced last time. Like this, right here. Let E be an extension field of F. So E is a bigger field. Always remind yourself of that. F is the base field. E is the extension field. The Galois group of E over F, and by the way, this is not, as the author emphasizes, this is not a factor ring. Okay. Nothing about factor groups or factor rings here. This is this whole thing represents a group. Galois group of E over F, F represents the set of all automorphisms of E that also have one other property. They keep they map each element of F to itself. We say these automorphisms keep F fixed. 
more precisely to keep each individual element of f fixed. So if alpha is an element of the Galois group of E over F, that's going to imply alpha of X equals X for all X in the base field, for all X and F. But not necessarily the identity on points outside of it. And that's where it gets interesting is when it's not the identity on points outside of it. Okay. So that's what it means to fix the base field F. You can show this is a subgroup of R. And it, again, it's called the Galois group of P over F. Um, you should, that, that could be a final exam question. Show that this is a subgroup. What should we do? Think back to chapter, what was it? Seven? No, three. When you first defined subgroups, there was a one step and two step subgroup test. Let's think about it as far as a two step subgroup test. Certainly, the identity automorphism is in the Galois group. By that, I mean the identity automorphism on E, mapping everything of E to, from E to itself, therefore also mapping everything from F to itself. So this is certainly not empty. And it does contain an identity element, as all groups have to have. And it would be the identity function. Epsilon of x equals x, this time for all x in the bigger field, the Function composition is always associative. So we won't bother. You can just say that. We, all, we know that from the past. If you compose two automorphisms, do you get an automorphism? Yes, because they're both going to map E to itself. And so the composition is going to map E to itself. And we know when you compose two one-to-one -one functions, you get a one-to-one -one function. When you compose two onto functions, you get an onto function. That's all verification that oddity is a group. We want to verify that the <clears throat> Galois group is a group. We want to verify that it's closed under function composition and taking of inverses. If you've got two elements of the Galois group, <clears throat> the only issue is, do they fix the elements of that? Well, that's pretty easy. X, B, and F. Then alpha of beta of X is alpha of x is x because alpha and beta are both in the Galois group. And so x, x is an arbitrary element of f. That means the composition is going to fix f as uh, well, fix elements of f, and will be in the Galois group. And it's closed undertaking inverses. If alpha is in the Galois group, then alpha of x equals x for all x in f again. Give me an arbitrary x. How do you show that alpha inverse is in the Galois group? Well, apply alpha inverse to both sides of this equation. I hope you would guess that that would be the thing to do. That simplifies down to x. That's going to be true for all x in f as well. So by the two-step subgroup test, which really includes three steps because you showed the thing is not empty first, that would imply the Galois group is a subgroup of the group of automorphisms. Any questions? So that's something that would be a nice little mix of what we're doing at the end here in group theory, chapter three in particular, that I could see possibly coming up on the exam. Here's an alternative notation you'll see in some textbooks. The Galois group of E over F written as the group of automorphisms of E that fix F. You put the F down there. You'll see this in some textbooks. If H is a subgroup of the Galois group, 
of E over F. We got one group as a group, it's going to have subgroups. You can define something else called the fixed field of H, which is a field extension of F and a subfield of E by the following equation right there. EH, E sub H is the set of things in E that get fixed by everything in H. So coming back to this picture, in general, EH is going to be something between F and E, so to speak. It contains F and is a subfield of E. What are the set of things in E that gets fixed by everything in H? Phi is an element of H, which is a subgroup of the Galois group whose elements consist of these automorphisms that fix F. Hope it's clear that you could say something like this. Um, e sub Galois group of E over F is F. The fixed field of the Galois group is the fixed field F. Well, or at least F is contained in it. Maybe it's not completely obvious that they're equal. And then the fixed field of the trivial subgroup is going to be actually all of E. Epsilon, the identity function, mapping everything in E to itself is going to fix E. So you could write that kind of equation. And then you have things between these two extremes. All right, now we're on to our main examples, which is the main thing we want to do is we want to illustrate these ideas with two in-depth examples. These examples are taken from your textbook. It was a process of me trying to make sure I understood the examples and they can communicate them to you. And there are a fair number of things I want to mention that are not mentioned in the book and will definitely be worth taking um, note of. Here's the first example. And I'm going to motivate this example with a question. A question that may seem like it could be difficult at first. What are all the subfields of this field extension of the rationals that contain the rationals? Certainly you can think of a few of them, I think, offhand. There's certainly Q itself. There's certainly this field extension itself, Q adjoining root 3 and root 5. And I would hope you would guess that probably Q of root 3 and Q of root 5 are a couple more answers. But are there any others? Maybe we should start making a lattice diagram as well. Power of fields here, we have Q adjoining root 3, square root of 5, Q of root 3, Q adjoining root 3, and Q adjoining root 5 are going to be subfields of that. By the way, that's something you should be able to prove in the test as well. And they are, they are fields by definition, so the only issue is are they subsets? Listen carefully, I'll give a quick argument. Um, it's not, not so hard actually in this case. Root 3 is definitely in this field and this field. Pretty much done. This by definition is the smallest field extension, the smallest subfield of the complex number, say, or the real numbers, containing both Q and root 3. Therefore, this has got to be a subset of that. That's what this notation means. This is the smallest subfield of, say, the reals, containing both the rationals and root 3. By definition, is the smallest, then it's got to be a subset of this field. So that kind of proof falls out basically by, de by definition. But you have to know that definition. You have to be able to use those words. 
Then we've got Q itself down here. Is there anything else? Maybe a couple other things. The fundamental theorem of Galois theory is going to provide the answer. About whether there are other things here. In this last diagram. Yeah, it turns out this question can be answered by constructing the Galois group of the all overall field extension over Q. But how do you do that? What exactly are the elements of this group? Like I said, certainly the identity element, the identity mapping is one element, but are there more? You would think there would be more. Got that? So that's what, what we're trying to get to. Does anybody remember from the reading? Maybe another example besides the identity element of something that would be in the scale log group? Did you do the reading? You remember? This was taken out of the book. It's an example from the book. <clears throat> Maybe a mapping that maps root 3, for example, to maybe negative root 3. Remember reading about that? And there's also the question of what it would do to the other elements as well, which the book, this is something the book kind of skirts over. What does it do to the other elements? And it sort of assumes you can tell. But I think it's not necessarily so clear when you're first trying to study this stuff. Here's the second slide for this example. And to do it, we're going to uh, require a fundamental fact that you should know for the exam. Okay. Let E be an extension field of the rationals. Then it turns out you can prove that any automorphism of E acts as the identity or fixes Q. Any automorphism. In other words, the Galois group of E over Q is the same as A E. Any automorphism of E is going to fix elements of Q. That takes proof. It's true. It's something you can use. How would you prove this? It's a little bit tricky. You kind of got to do it in steps. So you got a field extension of the rationals. You've got, say, phi an automorphism of E, the goal would be to show that essentially phi is in the Galois group of E over Q. In other words, it fixes elements of Q, i.e. phi of x equals x for all x in Q. And you kind of got to show this in stages. Um, the first stage would consist of verifying that phi fixes all integers. Give me an arbitrary integer n. Verify phi fixes n. You've got to use the properties of ring homomorphisms. Now, there's kind of two ways you could go here with an arbitrary n here that's taken to be an integer. Well, and in both ways, you could think of it as n times 1. But you could think of that, that multiplication there as being either a multiplication in the ring Z, or you could think of it as adding 1 to itself n times, at least if n is positive. And because of that, you could think of this either as phi of n times phi of 1, or n times phi of 1. Both are valid when you're working over the integer. This one is valid because phi is doubly operation preserving and preserves multiplication of integers. And this one is valid because phi is a group homomorphism under addition. Thinking of n times 1 as being 1 added to itself n times. 
you can factor out the n. You get phi of 1 added to itself n times, at least if n is positive. This is true even when n is negative, though, too, it turns out. So you can think of it either way. So evidently, phi of n must equal n. And that's, that's the conclusion here. You can conclude it either way. You also know phi of 1 is, is 1. Ring homomorphisms on fields are going to map 0 to 0 and, and 1 to 1 as well. Okay, so you can think of it either way. But either way, you get the conclusion that phi of n is n. So phi fixes integers. How about rational numbers? Well, first consider fractions of the form 1 over n. Maybe it's easier to show that they fix, phi fixes fractions of the form 1 over n first. And that is the best thing to do. And to use a little trick, phi does map 1 to itself. N1, since we're working in the rational numbers, could be thought of as n times 1 over n. Now use the fact that phi is a ring homomorphism to write that like this. And finally use the fact that you just verified that phi of n is n to, to write this. And now effectively it's dividing both sides by n. This is going to imply that phi of 1 over n equals 1 over n. I'm assuming n is not 0 here. Finally, for an arbitrary rational number, say m over n, write it as m times 1 over n, and use the fact that phi is a ring homomorphism so it preserves multiplication, and use the facts you've already proved. Like that. Okay? So this is a level of a proof I could imagine coming up in the final exam as well. And I actually did not start writing the final yesterday. I haven't written it yet. I'm going to start writing it. Probably I'll start today and finish it tomorrow. But I still have some keys to work on for you guys too. So I'm going to make a few of those things together. Okay, so that's an important fact that you should know is true. It's number one, exercise number one in chapter 32. It's going to be one of the ones I assign uh, for completion from chapter 32. I'm not going to assign a ton of problems from chapter 32, but a few of them at least. So you're currently working still on 21 and 22 here very soon. There won't be many from 32, just to get just enough to get a little feel. Why? We just essentially verify it. Back to the example, we're going to use this fundamental fact here for the example. How will an element of this group act on root 3 and root 5? is a question we might want to answer to help us figure out this Galois group. Okay, continuing to use properties of ring homomorphisms and some tricks. We know 3, for example, will equal phi of 3 for an arbitrary element of this Galois group because arbitrary elements of the Galois group fix the rationals and therefore they fix integers. How am I going to bring root 3 into play? I know 3 is root 3 squared. That's the trick to bring into play. Now you can use the fact that phi is operation preserving. Doubly so, under multiplication, you can write this as phi of root 3 squared. So whatever phi of root 3 is, its square better equal 3. In other words, there's only two possibilities. Phi of root 3 is plus or minus root 3. And a similar calculation is going to imply phi of root 5 is plus or minus root 5. That greatly limits what can happen, right? This is going to make the Galois group finite for one thing, for sure. There's still the question about whether these possibilities, based on this, determine actualities. Are, you know, that's just saying what phi does to root 3 and root 5. What about other elements of this field right there? What about other elements? 
do we get actual, actual ring homomorphisms? Are they really operation preserving? But what are the elements of this thing? This could be an exam question too. What are the elements of this field? How can you write them? We've talked about this already. Um, think of it in terms of vector spaces, linear combinations of basis elements. What's a basis going to consist of? Basis as a vector space over the rationals is going to consist of 1, root 3, root 5, and anything else. Root 15. Root 15, yeah. Multiply those two elements. Root 3 times root 5 is square root of 15. I'm saying root here, I mean square root, of course. We are going to deal with cube roots as well. That's a basis, so any element of this is going to be a linear combination of those basis elements where the scalars are rationals. So evidently, if we're going to come up with formulas for possible automorphisms here, we'll need to think of our inputs like that. And by the way, you could think of, um, do a similar calculation with 15 and say phi of root 15 is plus or minus root 15. I guess you could do that with, oh, okay, those are the only irrational basis elements in here, so I guess that would be enough, but maybe these are not all consistent with each other. That's another issue. Are all these, can I do any of these possibilities all together in one function? It's not necessarily the case, and in fact, I'm telling you, it's not the case. You can't do arbitrary combinations of these plus or minuses for these different things and get a definite automorphism of this. We'll see that in a minute. Actually, we can see it right now because we can write <clears throat> phi of root 15, which I know is plus or minus root 15, is going to be the same as phi of root 3 times root 5, which by the fact that phi is operation preserving is phi of root 3 times phi of root 5. So if I pick values for phi of root 3 and phi of root 5, phi of root 15 is determined. It can't be just either plus or minus root 15. If both, if both of these are positive, if this is positive root 3 and this is positive root 5, this will be positive root 15. If both of them are negative, if this one's negative root 3 and this one's negative root 5, this will be positive root 15. Two negatives making a positive. If one's positive and the other's negative, this will be negative. So you don't have complete freedom here. We've lost some degrees of freedom like in statistics. Right. Um, once these values are picked, this one's determined. But it does have to be plus or minus root 15. But what would the general formulas be, and are they really automorphisms, and are there no others? All right, we're going to use Mathematica here now. So I was trying to work with this, first of all, by hand. And the calculations were just too unpleasant by hand. So I decided to use Mathematica that afternoon. How? How could you possibly use Mathematica on this? <clears throat> Take a little look at what we've got here. I claim that that is an example of an automorphism in the Galois group in terms of its formula based on the way we write elements of this field as linear combinations of the basis elements. What's this one going to do? It's going to map root 3 
to negative root 3 and an e. Rational coefficient just gets carried along for the ride. And it's going to map root 5 to positive root 5. And because it maps this one to negative and this one to positive, it's got to map root 15 to negative root 15. Again, the a, b, c, and d just get carried along for the ride. I want to verify that this is operation preserving. Both under addition and multiplication, I want to verify these two properties. Especially with this one, if you look at that, it's, it would not be too pleasant to do by hand. And when I was trying to do it by hand, it was definitely not very pleasant. What can I use Mathematica for to do this? So, here I have code that will verify the, the equality of these things. This one's for the sum. Alpha of the sum, this code is going to um, compute this thing. Alpha of the sum. In this code, sum of alphas is going to compute this thing, sum of alphas. How? Well, essentially, I'm just adding these elements as linear combinations. You see I'm adding them there. And at the end, to essentially perform the mapping, I'm replacing root 3 with negative root 3 and replacing root 15 with negative root 15. That slash dot operation is essentially what does, does the mapping, alpha. I get this. And here, I'm just expanding this sum, and I already have the negative signs in there. I already applied alpha there. And you do get the same thing. Double check, you get the same thing. These do match up. The sum's not too hard to do. The product is a little bit more painful, especially by hand. Here's alpha of the product. So the only distinction here between what I did up there and down here is I have a time there. But it is a lot messier in the output. Twice as messy, you might say. And here I'm doing it, doing it um, with expand. And I already have a negative sign in there. And you do get the same thing. I see that these match up. Is that big enough to see, by the way? Maybe zoom in with the camera if you need to. Okay. All right, so that's verifying that that particular function is operation preserving. That's one other automorphism. What are others? This one's another one. Beta. Mapping root 3 to root 3 root 5 to negative root 5, root 15 to negative root 15 because we have one map to a positive, one to map to a negative with root 3 and root 5, that means root 15 got to get mapped to negative root 5. And you can do the same kind of things, let's just verify the product. And the, this is a different mapping, these, these are different things than the other one. Similar, but different with minus signs in different spots. You can see that these match up. If root 3 gets mapped to negative root 3 and root 5 gets mapped to negative root 5, then root 15 has got to get mapped to positive root 15. And really, this is alpha composed beta. That's what, the way I wrote it, alpha composed beta. And once again, you can enter this code. You can see if you get the same thing. Let's do it with the product here. Double check those over. See that they are the same. This thing down here, which I call gamma, that's a gamma there, right there. That's not, 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 not an automorphism. Even though root 3 is getting mapped to negative root 3, root 5 is getting mapped to negative root 5, which are possibilities, and root 15 is getting mapped to negative root 15, the negative sign here is inconsistent with the negative signs there. That's the problem. So evidently, we should not get the same thing here. These two things should not be the same thing. They start out the same. Where are there any differences? Oh, uh, there's a difference right there. Minus plus. There's another difference. Minus plus again. I think there's a couple more spots. Those signs don't match. And these signs don't match. 
It's not an automorphism. It, it's, it does preserve addition, but it doesn't preserve multiplication. That's the problem. And essentially, because of the condition on, on conditions on root 3, root 5, and root 15, we have found all the automorphisms. We've found the Galois group. The Galois group of Q adjoining root 3, root 5 over Q consists of four elements the identity automorphism, epsilon, the alpha, the beta, and alpha composed beta. And all of these non identity elements have order two. Think about it. The negative signs become positive when you apply it twice. This is isomorphic to the external direct product of Z2 with itself, which is not safe. Another quick review of group theory, right? This is group of order four, it's either isomorphic to this external direct product or Z4. It's not cyclic. cyclic. There's no element in order four there. It's got to be this one. Okay. By the way, if you came in late, there is no quiz today because we had so much to do. Let's take our 30 second stretch break. You also missed pictures of me when I was young. I came in late. <coughs> me and my football team. Well, let's get to 30 seconds, at least. Well, yeah. <coughs> so you'll probably want to watch the beginning so you'll see the pictures of me. Um, we're going to finish example one now. Example two is a harder example. But because of time, we're going to have to go faster with it. Okay. You're finishing example one, just summarizing things. Are we wrote that on the board? What are the subgroups of this? What does the subgroup lattice look like? What are the fixed fields of the subgroups of the Galois group? And what does the fundamental theorem of Galois theory have to say about this lattice in relation to our original question? What was the original question? The original question was what are the subfields of this thing here that contain the Q? Okay, so what are the subgroups? There would be the trivial one. Let's make a lattice of subgroups here. There's the trivial one. There's the one generated by alpha. There's the one generated by beta. And there's the one generated by alpha composed beta. Would be the subgroups of order two. There's no subgroups of order one or three by, or excuse me, three of order three by Lagrange's theorem. Then there's the entire Galois group itself. The lattice of subgroups of the Galois group, it's, a, it's a, uh, something that follows from the fundamental theorem of Galois theory is that the lattice of subgroups for your Galois group is the same as the lattice of subfields except sort of turned upside down. Now, it doesn't look like it's upside down. Uh, what do I mean when I say it's upside down? I mean in terms of fixed fields. The fixed field of epsilon, the trivial subgroup over there, epsilon is the identity mapping, is the entire Field extension E, the big one, back here. Epsilon's at the bottom of the other diagram, this is at the top. 
the fixed field of the entire Galois group at the top corresponds, is Q, to the bottom of this diagram. These things are in the middle, just like you have subgroups in the middle. So the diagrams look effectively the same, but they are turned upside down from each other. What's the fixed field coming back over here of this subgroup? In other words, what subfield is alpha? Alpha maps root 3 to negative root 3, and root 15 to negative root 15, but it maps root 5 to root 5. Its fixed field, coming back over here, is that one. So I guess I should put it in the other order. Its field's fixed field is that one. You don't have to. So there's a matchup of pictures. The subgroup consisting of epsilon and beta, beta fixes root 3. It's that one. What's the fixed field of this subgroup? That's got to be the one more thing that's missing in our diagram. Epsilon times beta. What did that do? I forgot. It mapped, okay, it mapped root 3 to negative root 3 and root 5 to negative root 5, but it mapped root 15 to positive root 15. And that is a field that we're missing. Q adjoining root 15, and it's the only subfield of this that extends this that we are missing from this diagram. Come back over here. In this diagram, these twos that I'm writing on here represent the index of the given subgroup as a subgroup of the subgroup directly above it. Epsilon has index two in each of these, two cosets in the factor group. And these things have index two in the whole group. Or think of it in terms of Lagrange's theorem. The order of this is four, the order of this, for example, is two, four divided by two is two. These are indices of these subgroups in the group directly above it. Number of left cosines, size of the factor. Coming back over here, I could also put twos by these lines. What did those numbers represent in powers of fields, these diagrams? Those didn't represent indices but they represented with something with similar notation with the colon and square brackets. Call it the degree. The degree of this over this is two. What did degree mean? Some other word that starts with D. Di. Dimension. Dimension of this is a vector space over that. You got a basis of two elements. <coughs> And you can multiply the numbers along here to get the dimension of this over this. 2 times 2 is 4. We had a basis of four elements overall. So the fundamental theorem of Galois theory makes this connection. It makes, makes it so you know this is the entire lattice diagram of the fields. Tower of fields is sometimes called. All right, so yeah, example two is, is harder and um, Longer, definitely, so we must go faster here, unfortunately. Consider this number, omega. I'm going to draw a picture of the complex plane here now. Omega is a cube root of three, or excuse me, a cube root of one. Here's the complex plane, the real axis, the imaginary axis, the unit circle in the complex plane. Pretend that's a circle. Radius one centered at the origin. This one really represents I right there, but it is one unit away from the origin, so we would typically label it with a one in an ordinary diagram. This is negative one, this is negative i here. 
omega, negative one half plus root three over two i is right about here, that's omega. This angle right there is 120 degrees. That's where omega is. It's called a primitive cube root of unity. Don't worry about what that means. It does solve x cubed minus 1, but x cubed minus 1 is not its minimal polynomial over q. <clears throat> Instead, its minimal polynomial is x squared plus x plus 1. You multiply x minus this omega right there times x minus its complex conjugate. There's the negative sign there. You're going to get a real polynomial of degree 2 that's going to have this thing as a root general, so its complex conjugate as a root. And by the way, its complex conjugate is also its square by the geometry of complex multiplication. Omega squared, just label a little further this way. Omega squared is right there, and this is a 240 degree angle. And this is also the minimal polynomial for omega squared. Also, the complex conjugate of omega. Q adjoint omega then is the splitting field for this f of x over Q and has this um, splitting field has degree 2 over Q. It would have 1 and omega as a basis for this set as a writing the elements as unique linear combinations of 1 and omega, a plus b times omega. Next, consider another number that's a cube root of 2. In fact, a real cube root of 2. I'm emphasizing that it's real. You know, that would be about 1 point, I don't know, 2 something. It's got a minimal polynomial, x cubed minus 2, both over q and over q adjoint omega. That could be considered the minimal polynomial for either one. I'm going to consider it to be with coefficients in q omega. Of course, these coefficients are in integers, but that means they're also rationals, and it means they're also in this set, so I can think of it as being over that field. Now I'm going to adjoin both of these things. Consider this thing. Q adjoin omega, then adjoin the real q root of 2 to get this, this thing right there, which, by the way, would be a simple field extension. You would be able to find some element such as this equals q of a, that other element, but we will not be finding that. That's a splitting field for g of x over q omega, and the index is, or the degree is 3. And therefore, overall, the degree of the biggest extension here over the rationals is 3 times 2 is 6. And we can start to make a, a lattice diagram here. Power of fields for what's going on in here. We're certainly going to have this as a subfield containing Q. Do we have others? The answer is yes. This is degree 3, this is degree 2, and so overall you have degree 6, 3 times 2. What are we after? We're after the Galois group of this field over Q. What then is this Galois group? Certainly it's got the identity, epsilon. As you might imagine, it's got more elements in it. Before we figure out those elements, let me also make a few other points in this picture here in the complex plane. <coughs> Cube root of 2, as a real number, is going to be about there. It's also going to be important to identify where omega times Cube root of 2 is, and also omega squared times Cube root of 2. When you multiply complex numbers, their arguments get multiplied, or their, their distances to the origin get multiplied, and their angles add. So if 
I multiply this by omega or omega squared, it stays the same distance to the origin, but the angle gets added. If I multiply this by omega, I get another number that's the same distance to the origin, that's an angle 120 degrees away from the positive real axis. This number up here is going to be omega cube root of 2. And omega squared cube root of 2 is going to be down here. That's going to be helpful to think about as well. Again, my goal is to find this Galois group. According to the fundamental theorem of the Galois, Galois theory, which again, I'm not, I'm not writing the fundamental theorem of Galois theory, I'm just <coughs> verbally telling you what you can conclude from it because its statement is very long and confusing. So I'm just trying to give you the basic idea here. It is in the book. It's going to turn out that the last diagram for the tower of fields here and the last diagram for the Galois group are going to be matched up together, inverted in a sense. And that will also tell you that because this field extension has degree 6, the Galois group has order 6 as well. So it's got to be isomorphic to one of two possibilities, Z6 or S3. Those are the two groups up to isomorphism of order 6. Though S3, by the way, does have a different, different symbol. S3 is also isomorphic to D3, the dihedral group, symmetry of an equilateral triangle. It's got six elements. S4 is not isomorphic to D4, though, so don't, don't continue thinking that carries over. But there are two groups of isomorphism of order 6, <laughs> Z6 or S3, with the second again being isomorphic to D3. But which one is it? And what does that apply about our um, tower of fields picture? To determine the answer, it's important to note the following facts. First fact, since omega cubed and uh, equals 1, and also omega squared plus omega plus 1 is 0, the minimal polynomial for omega was f of x equals x squared plus x plus 1. It also follows that omega squared satisfies that middle polynomial, which we already knew actually, but you can verify it without using the fact that it equals negative one half minus root three over two i. Use facts about omega, omega squared squared is omega to the fourth, which is omega times omega cubed, but omega cubed is one. This simplifies to zero as well. And by the way, omega squared cubed would also equal one just like omega cubed. In other words, omega squared is also zero. We already knew that, actually, but I'm just sort of thinking about it differently. It's also helpful to note that since omega cubed is one, those other three dots that I made, cube root of two, omega cube root of two, and omega squared cube root of two, all satisfy g of x. They're zeros of g of x. They are all cube roots of two. Two's over here. And that makes sense geometrically, too. I mean, you cube, cube root of 2, you're going to get 2. You cube these things, the angles add, and the, the distances to the origin multiply. The distance to the origin is the same as the distance to the origin of this thing. So when you multiply them, you, you multiply that distance times itself, you cube it. You've got to get a distance of 2 for the cube of these things, and the angles have to add up to 360 degrees for the one that's 120, and 720 degrees for the one that's 240 degrees, which in either case brings you back to 2. These are all cube roots of 2. But you can verify it purely algebraically as well. Third fact, any operator, here's the most important new kind of thing. Any automorphism of this field Being operation preserving will permute, quote unquote, as in permutation, as in permutation group, these zeros amongst themselves. For example, EG means, for example, omega squared plus 
omega plus 1 equals 0 implies that if you apply an automorphism to both sides of this equation, phi of this thing must equal phi of 0, which is 0, which by the operation preserving nature of phi means phi of omega also satisfies that equation. In other words, since the two solutions of that equation are omega and omega squared, phi of omega has got to either be omega or omega squared. This is stuff the book, again, kind of just doesn't really mention. For an automorphism, an element of the Galois group it's going to turn out that phi of omega is either omega or omega squared. And phi of cube root of 2, it's going to turn out, is either cube root of 2 or omega cube root of 2 or omega squared. So the fact that the automorphisms are operation preserving is an important thing in terms of determining what the possibilities are. Just like the, like it was for the simpler example. What about general formulas in terms of these um, this field as a vector space? Uh, a six-dimensional vector space. Yikes. Over the rations. It's going to turn out if alpha maps omega to omega squared and cube root of 2 to cube root of 2, here is a formula for it. And it's kind of complicated. Okay. What did I do to figure out this formula? Um, so again, first of all, this field, the overall field extension, the big one here, is a six-dimensional vector space over Q. And a basis consists of 1 omega 2 to the 1 third, which is cube root of 2, real. 2 to the 2 thirds, omega 2 to the 1 third, and omega 2 to the 2 thirds. You might be wondering where is omega squared in all this. You don't need it in the basis description. Um, where did I, how did I figure this out? I forgot. <laughs> OK. Omega is getting mapped to omega squared. So this part, so to speak, is getting mapped to b times omega squared. But omega squared is negative omega minus 1, right? Because omega squared plus omega plus 1 is 0. So I could replace the omega squared that I get after I map this thing to be omega squared with negative omega minus 1. And that minus 1 is why I get a negative b there. This thing. Omega 2 to the 1 third, by the fact that alpha is operation preserving, is going to map to this. Alpha maps omega to omega squared. It maps 2 to the 1 third to itself. Therefore, this thing gets mapped to that thing. So when I think about mapping this term, it gets mapped to E omega squared 2 to the 1 third. E, by the way, is not 2.7. It's just an arbitrary coefficient here, rational number. This gets mapped to e omega squared 2 to the 1 third. And replacing omega squared again by negative omega minus 1, that ends up helping me get, for example, a negative e here and a negative e omega there, for example. It's kind of complicated. And it's easy to make mistakes. But that turns out to be its formula. This is something the book doesn't show you. This is something I figured out on my own. For beta, if I let beta map omega to omega and cube root of 2 to omega cube root of 2, then the general formula for beta, once again using this thing, is a similarly complicated thing. Okay, I found this helpful for me. 
in thinking about this example, and by the way, this example is example five, the book doesn't give you this kind of detail, but I found it really helpful. But really nasty to think about if you're doing stuff by hand, and therefore I also went to Mathematica to verify that these things were operation preserving. Um, I was not having success with beta. I think I was typing something in Mathematica incorrectly. I'm not going to show you the Mathematica, but just know that I used it just like with the first example to try to verify these things are operation preserving. I did put the notebook on this, the shared drive. It's not quite finished because, again, I couldn't quite get it to work for beta. I think, I, again, I was typing something incorrectly into Mathematica. It was complicated. <laughs> uh, I'm pretty sure this formula is right. Okay. So even though the description of what they map to is fairly simple, their formulas are fairly complicated. But it's good to know that even with these complicated formulas that you can get operation preserving out of it. Okay, quickly over the slide, since alpha omega is omega squared, we are almost done here. And it, that means that alpha of omega squared is omega by operation preserving properties, essentially. You can ultimately conclude that alpha squared is epsilon. In other words, alpha has order two in the Galois group. Remember, the Galois group has order six. It's isomorphic to either Z6 or S3. Doing a similar kind of thought process with beta, you can ultimately conclude that beta, which again maps omega to omega and maps cube root of two to omega cube root of two, alpha and beta are just these particular special mappings here. You can conclude that beta has order three in the Galois group. Also, for example, you get these couple facts by composition of these functions and operation preserving nature of alpha and beta. And this allows you to conclude that alpha composed beta is not equal to beta composed alpha. Our Galois group is not abelian. It's got to be isomorphic to S3. And it also turns out you can write the six elements in this way. Now I've got one more slide to show you that's on kind of something that feels very different. But before I show you that slide, and I didn't really want to erase this picture, I want you to realize that alpha and beta can be thought of as permutations. Technically speaking, they are functions whose domains are fields. But in terms of what they do with these roots, if they permute them, Alpha could be thought of as the two cycle omega omega squared composed with a two cycle, or is it a three cycle? Cube root of two, oh, sorry, oh, no, it is a two cycle. Cube root of two gets mapped to itself under alpha. Omega cube root of two gets mapped to omega squared and cube root of two. These are two two cycles, permutations in cycle notation. Not using numbers as the symbols that are being permuted, but these, these symbols, these roots, as being what, what are being permuted. In other words, alpha, alpha, I think is complex conjugation. It maps these things to themselves, omega to omega squared and back and forth. And it maps omega cube root of 2 to omega squared cube root of 2, and vice versa. Alpha is really complex conjugation in the complex plane. But as permutations, it's a composition of two two cycles, two disjoint two cycles. What about beta? Beta maps cube root of 2 to omega cube root of 2. And you can check it maps omega cube root of 2 to omega squared cube root of 2. It's a three cycle. And it maps omega to itself and omega squared to itself. You can think of these as permutations, chapter five. 
Okay, one more slide. This slide has a different feel to it. It's not examples. It's a slide about the big picture of what's going on here. By the way, I didn't finish the lattice over there, but your book has got a picture of it. Think about all the subgroups of S3, and you get the corresponding lattice diagram for the fields. This is about the purpose. What was Galois thinking in all of this? Galois was wanting to find an example, at least one example, of a quintic not solvable by radicals. No formula involving the square roots, cube roots, fourth roots, fifth roots, fourth roots of this quintic. The book gives one example of such a polynomial, this quintic right here. 3x to the fifth minus 15x plus 15. And here's an outline of their argument that it is not solvable by radicals. Okay, I don't expect you to understand this completely, okay? It's just giving you a basic idea. Turns out this is irreducible over Q by Eisenstein's criterion with P equal to um, 3 or 5. Five, yeah, I guess I can't divide the, the leading coefficient. Um, turns out this polynomial has three real zeros and two complex zeros that are complex conjugates. The splitting field for this quintic over Q is just Q adjoining these five roots, especially by definition. This degree is going to be five because this is fifth degree. This is a minimal polynomial for any one of these roots. I pick A1 there, but I could pick A2, A3, A4, or A5 there. The degree of this is going to be five. The Grange's theorem implies then that the Galois group is divisible by five. The Grange's theorem as well as the fundamental theorem of Galois theorem. It's matching up the lattice of fields with the lattice of groups in the Galois group. If you got an extension of order five, you're going to have a subgroup of index five in the Galois group, meaning the Galois group is divisible by five in its order. Moreover, automorphisms of K permute the A's, just kind of, kind of like when we're permuting these roots over here in this picture. And are completely determined by this action. And it turns out, with some work, you can verify that this Galois group is actually isomorphic to S5, which has, remember, five factorial 120 elements in it. Yikes. And lots and lots of subgroups. You do not want to try to draw the last diagram for the subgroups of this thing. But you can still prove this is isomorphic to S5. Turns out there are two cycles, and, and there are five cycles. And when you've got two cycles and five cycles, it's going to be isomorphic to S5, is what the book says. Cauchy's theorem, you remember that? Uh, okay, actually, this, this argument is the argument of why it's isomorphic to S5. Actually, this is just saying it's isomorphic to a subgroup of S5, but it here is actually isomorphic to S5. But what about S5? What's, what's the significance of this? S5 turns out to not be a solvable group which by a theorem in chapter 32 implies that the equation is not solvable by radicals. But that just begs the question, what's a solvable group? It's kind of a complicated idea. It's on page, the definition's on page um, 538, and there's some theorems related to it. Let me just say that solvable groups are related to groups, to factor groups that are related to group, whether groups are abelian or not. All those group theory ideas, factor groups, is the group abelian or non-abelian, come into play in the definition of whether a group is solvable or not. And therefore is then related to whether quintics are solvable by radicals or not. Okay? That's a very broad outline of it. It's not something you can get without a lot of study. If this stuff intrigues you, um, in Foundations of Math, you are certainly fine with doing Galois theory. Uh, for your project, even though we've done chapter 32, because we've only done it a small amount, right? Because you can do a lot more yet. Yeah. Talk about it a little bit more on Friday, then we'll do our general review. See you then.